Hello everybody and welcome back to the online book discussion for Richard Rohr's Eager, Eager, <laughs> Eager to Love, um, which is a study on St. Francis of Assisi and St. Clair and just the understanding of mysticism as it was in the early church and how we as the modern day church can bring it back into the reality that we experience the power of God showing up on earth now. You know, many times you hear that people say that they, you know, they know Jesus, they love Jesus, and they're just waiting to go to heaven. And, you know, that's something maybe you can say when you first believe, but when you're here 50, 60, 70 years, and all you're doing is just waiting to go to heaven, um, there's something that you've got to look at and, and figure out, is that really what we're meant to do, is just sit back, relax, and wait till we die and go to heaven? So that's what's good about these kind of discussions is you can discuss this with a group of friends or with your Bible study group or just even casual conversation at lunchtime, you know, or even just taking it on as your own personal study to really look into from time to time what it is that you believe. So what I've been doing is I've been going through the book and I've been posting questions that you can get for free. Um, they're in a PDF form, print it off, use it with whoever you'd like, share it with whomever. And um, you have this as your um, your starting point if you don't want to buy the book necessarily, to, uh, to just kind of listen in and see what you think about it and then maybe pick up a copy of the book later. I've been following uh, Richard Rohr for some years now and I definitely, the more I um, walk this journey I really understand that there are some things that I've just caught on as tenets of the mandates of how you believe in God. Um, the older I get and the more I look at the world, the more I understand is maybe we haven't gotten it completely right. So I don't think we ever get it fully right, um, but we should not just stay stagnant in one understanding, especially when it's so contradicting what we're seeing going on in the world, good or bad. So let's go ahead and get started. We are in chapter four and specifically we're going to look at the segment entitled the sacramental meaning of the word. Sacrament is something that you hear about uh, mostly in the Catholic, the Lutheran, um, denominations, but it's something that you hear about in other denominations as well. And so this is kind of a take on the understanding of what would it mean if we looked at the world and found sacraments within the world's setting and environment and atmosphere. So we're going to be looking today at pages 45 to 51. Although I've been using the phrase beyond the birdbath as a foil by which to distinguish authentic Franciscan spirituality from its cheap counterfeits, there is also a reason that the images of Francis in the garden and with animals took over in art, memory, and poetry. Many seem to feel that Francis looks more at home in the yard than in the sanctuary. And it seems he often did, judging from the quotes that began at the chapter. So at the beginning of this chapter, there were a couple of quotes. I'll read them to you. Bonaventure says, Let us place our first step at the bottom, presenting to ourselves the whole material world as a mirror through which we may pass over to God. Thomas of Solano saying of Francis, he rejoiced in all the works of the hands of the Lord and saw behind things pleasant to behold their life-giving reason and cause. In beautiful things he saw beauty itself. All things were to him good. And Thomas of Solano says, Toward little worms even he glowed with a very great love. He picked them up from the road and placed them in a safe place lest they be crushed by the feet of passers-by. The sacramental meaning of the word. In stories of his life, Francis is quoted as talking to or about larks, lambs, rabbits, pheasants, falcons, cicadas, waterfowl, bean, bees, the famous wolf of Gubo, 
pigs whom he praised for generously giving their bodies for our food, and hooked fish that he tried to throw back into the waters whenever possible. He addresses inanimate creation too, as if it were indeed ensouled, which we know because his canticle of the creatures includes fire, wind, water, brother sun, sister moon, and of course, our sister mother earth. He even told the friars to only cut down part of a tree for their needs so that it might have the hope of sprouting again. So-called nature mysticism was in fact a worthy first path for Francis and also for Bonaventure, who saw all things as likeness of God, fingerprints and footprints that reveal the divine DNA, underlying all living links in the great chain of being. Both Francis and Bonaventure laid the foundation for which John Duns Scotus would later call the, univers the university of all being, and what Don Nothfair, a Franciscan sister, calls cosmic mutuality. Creation itself, not ritual or spaces constructed by human hands, was Francis's primary cathedral, which then drove him back into the needs of the city very similar to Jesus' own movement between desert solitude and small town healing ministry. The gospel transforms us by putting us in touch with that which is much more constant and satisfying. Literally the ground of our being and has much more reality to it rather than theological concepts or the mere ritualization of reality. Daily cosmic events in the sky and on the earth are the reality above our heads and beneath our feet every minute of our lives, a continuous sac sacrament. I find that a preoccupation with religious rituals tends to increase the more we, re we remain untouched by reality itself, to which the best rituals can only point. Remember, even question 16 of the Baltimore Catechism answered firmly and clearly and definitively that God is everywhere. Jesus himself commonly points to the things like the red sky, a hen, lilies, the fig tree, a donkey caught in a pit, the birds of the air, the grass in the field, the temple animals which he released from their cages, and on and on. He was clearly looking at the seemingly non-religious world ordinary things all around him, and appeared to do most of his teaching outside. Francis said, wherever we are, wherever we go, we bring our cell with us. Our brother body is our cell, and our soul is the hermit living in the cell. If our soul does not live in peace and solitude within this cell, of what avail is it to live in a man-made cell? In the five-day men's rite of passage, there was a focus of my work for 15 years. So many men discovered that prayers and rituals inside of human scale buildings made of artificial construction materials also came to seem very domesticated and controlled. They often perceived that the salvation offered there was also small and churchy. Almost without exception, the greatest breakthroughs for our men occurred during the extended times of silence in nature, where the human and the merely verbal were not in control, and, or during rituals that were raw and earthy. The loss of the sacramentality of nature after Francis Sorry, let's try it again. This chapter, is, this segment is called The Loss of Sacramentality of Nature After Francis. Scholars say the Franciscan movement following St. Francis himself was not really known for any deep connection with nature, except for some of the stories and sayings surrounding Anthony of Padua and Giles of Assisi. The first short-lived generation dwelt in caves and hermitages, apart from the city, but we soon became gentrified and proper. I can remember my novice master in 1961 telling us we should not waste or consume or kill unnecessarily. But even such teachings were about private virtue and not presented as a social value or a necessity for the good of others. 
I never heard any direct teaching on sustainability or the sacramentality of nature itself in any of my 13 formational years. We were trying to be Franciscan in the most developed, capitalized, and industrialized country in the world. Sacraments happened to be happened in church buildings, not in the gardens or the woods. My thesis in this chapter is summed up by a quote from the Oxford scholar Roger Sorrell. Possibly with the clericalization of the sophistication of the order, Francis' legacy lost its primary context and reverence, relevance. It was too easily intellectualized, intellectualized away by those removed physically and mentally from creation's sublimity to which Francis was so close and with which he so intimately sympathized. Once we lost contact, regular contact with primal creation, I believe the Franciscan enterprise largely started to reflect whatever culture it inhabited, and that was no longer nature or the universe. The chosen and preferred home base for many Franciscans when I first joined appeared to be books, offices, the academy, and almost always the sacristy. Our professors taught us Latin and Greek instead of our, any pastoral languages. I can only remember a couple of friars of those who formed me, who had a garden or seemed to care about flowers, nature, animals, the universe, or anything that grew or changed. We seemed to prefer certain things to growing things, maybe because we were not around children. In most communities, dogs or cats were forbidden. There was a deep loneliness and sadness, and often eccentricity in many friars as a result, and celibacy was thus a huge mistake for their hearts and their basic humanity. Thank God there were enough except exceptions to let us know that being human, male, celibate, and Franciscan could indeed work. The sacramental meaning of the world was largely lost until its most recent rediscovery by seers that we usually think of as secular, mere nature mystics, poets, artists, people like Chief Seattle, John Muir, Rachel Carson, William Wordsworth, John James Audubon, Walt Whitman, Wendell Berry, Annie Dillard, Aldo Leopold, Thomas Berry, Ansel Adams, Bill Plotnam, Plotkin, Mary Oliver, and Brian Swame, to name some of the more outstanding. We Catholics ended up limiting sacramental to things like religious medals and blessed candles and holy water. Instead of honoring the inherent holiness of the earth ores, beeswax, H2O, that actually form them. Please think about that. We limited the official church sacraments to seven holy orders, where when there should be 700, as an old man once said to me in Tanzania, we ended up actually uh, desacralizing God's world without realizing it. The people we called pagans and animals actually had a head start on us because they at least saw the world as filled with spirits, whereas our world became empty, foreign, and without any natural balm for the soul. Wild was always bad, domesticated was always good. Yet C.S. Lewis said of God, in the character of the lion Aslan, he's wild, you know. Domesticated, of course, means subservient to us. We liked our, our world more than God's world, it seemed. For much of Christian history, we preached inside of a disenchanted, small, and lonely universe where there were no natural holiness or inherent goodness in anything non-human or non-Christian. I thought Jesus was savior of the world. We then tried to fill up the loneliness with books and ideas since the world beneath us and above us had become boring, merely functional, and not subject to the predictability we wanted. We humans prefer order and even a blessed rage for order, as Wallace Stevens said. And yet nature rarely complies. 
It is no accident that there are now so many eccentric and emotionally ill people in our world. They deem themselves insignificant after trying to live meaningfully inside of a universe that was itself meaningless. It does not work. And we Christians insisted on perfect order even after the crucifixion of Jesus after the crucifixion of Jesus had warned us about and promised us an extreme disorder. We grasp for meaning in merely mental ways when it was all around us in tangible and visible ways. We failed to kiss the ground on which we stood and preferred to fly off into the heavens. The first level of perception, according to Bonaventure, is toward exterior material objects. And only when we see respectfully and lovingly at that level can we ascend to his second and third levels of full spiritual seeing. Francis knew and taught that God did not lose energy by plunging into form, as Cynthia Bogold has so forcefully puts it, and that true transcendence is to be found in eminence and materiality itself. What a surprise! But most of us were Platonist. We're body and soul are enemies, much more than Christian incarnationalists, where body and soul were friends. And where were we to experience this incarnation? Precisely everywhere and all the time. And not just in places defined as sacred, special, churchy, or religious. That is why Paul called confident, could confidently tell us that we could and should pray always. Good, good stuff there, right? I myself have struggled with that idea of how in the world can you pray always? We have work to do. We have things to take care of. We're talking to people. We're listening to people. How in the world can you pray always? Well, we're going to delve into that a little bit. So here are your questions for the day. And as always, I offer these to you as a way to start the conversation, but it does not need to be where the conversation goes or ends. So here they are. Question one, what has been your experience with praying while in nature? Consider journaling for the next seven days your experience while walking in nature. And number two, did it surprise you to read how far the friars have moved away from what Francis's original vision was and revelations about nature? And have you seen that in other areas where somewhere someone starts with an idea and it's bright and vibrant and then somehow it's moved away from? And, 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 and why do we tend to do things like that? Have you experienced such a movement in your spiritual life towards nature or away from nature? And what adjustments, comments can you make on movements and what type of movements you've seen in your own life when it comes to prayer, to communion with nature? What have you experienced in those areas? Well, as always, it is my honor to be here with you, and I appreciate you dropping by. And please make sure and share this if this is something that you think your friends or family members or even someone in your group would um, really appreciate um, walking along with. Again, these can be just standalone videos, or you can come along with me in the conversation as we go through this book completely. It's completely up to you, just however you need to experience it. Thanks so much for stopping by.